first you know, part of the, the course. And now we are going to get in the second part of the course. We are starting this. Mm -hmm. Again, it's going to be long and very good. <laughs> this is very, very important. We begin with the correct understanding of worship. We wrestle with these things, abuses in the church, because oftentimes we lack understanding of what worship is about, what it is, and what it is about. Sometimes we preach at the people, okay? not really knowing the importance, the weight, the value of what we are doing. And so, in this course we are going to get deep into that. Knowledge of worship, what worship is, so that when we go to worship, especially to celebrate the Eucharist, we are really into the act of worship and we know what we are about, what it means. So to help us get a deeper understanding again of what it is, again we have to consult with the greatest theologian of our time. By the name of George Ratzinger, Pope Benedict. So, he wrote this book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Amazing. He goes in depth. As we said before, God gave this man a special gift, we call them charisms, to explain the mysteries of our faith. And so he has a charism. When you study him, some people are jealous of his charism. <laughs> So you will hear people say, especially some priests who say, oh, no, 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 they're not, they are the theologians, whatever, because they are jealous. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay? They, don't, they fail to recognize and appreciate the gift God gave to this man. So this book, will be using it a lot, okay, as we explain the meaning of the liturgy and the understanding of the liturgy. Okay, so this book will be basic to this you know, course. Then another book written by a monk okay, at the seminary in St. Abbott. The Benedict, the Benedictines, the Mount Angel, he wrote this book, What Happens at Mass, by the Jeremy Driscoll. He's now the adult, the leader of the monks at Mount Angel. It is a very, very good book, explaining what happens at Mass. So we'll be using this book a lot. It's in the notes. Yeah. So but it would be good to get the book and read it. Yeah. So it is very good what happens at Mass. We go to Mass, we leave without knowing what we are doing. Believe me. If you read this book, you will see what I'm talking about. Because if we understood what happens at Mass, the mode of our celebration would be different from what we normally do. Okay? So, we'll be using this. Then another book, of course, we will be using as med meditations. The book we, we have already, St. Mary Jane Vianney, the Eucharistic Meditations. Did someone drink one? Yes. Okay? Some of you think you don't have the book. But many of you do. Okay? We'll be reading excerpts okay, from this book, The Eucharistic Meditations of St. John Meridian. This is another man. God helped you to probe the mystery of the Eucharist, to understand Mass, to understand the Eucharist and its value. So in these Eucharistic Meditations, he explains to us, you know, gives us lessons. <coughs> on what to do and how to understand the mystery of Mass, the mystery of the Eucharist. Okay? So, we'll be reading again from this book. Then, of course, another book explaining so many things is again from Benedict the 16th, Jesus of Nazareth, part one. Okay? We'll be using this book because most of the explanations in these books we need for our purposes are in the notes. Okay? But so it's good to read. Because after explaining, then it's easier to read and understand. So Pope Benedict is not the uh, 
review channel. Okay? He's, you know, uses complex sometimes, you know, theological categories, so which we need to just read over and over again to understand. We'll be using this part one and then part two. Jesus of Nazareth, part two. Wow. Okay? So we'll be using these books now to explain what happens at Mass. And of course, using these two books we already talked about. The Roman Missal and the general instructions of the Roman Missal. The importance of this is this, that within the conference, this conference of bishops in the US, we have one conference of bishops. And we are the Roman Rite. So in the Roman Rite, we do the same thing. Okay? So but sometimes we go to different churches, they are doing different things. We are not going really to talk about topology, that the way some churches are built, okay? That may determine you know, where people stand and whatever. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the essence of the liturgy and what we should be doing. The church instructs us. We are in one conference, so we should be doing what we are instructed to do. Okay, as we're going to see in our initial begin course here at the beginning of our course, liturgy is not concocted. Worship is not concocted. Worship is revealed to us. In other words, we don't figure out how to worship God. God tells us how to do it. That's why you will see later on, like at our Mass, basically reading from Isaiah and of course the book of Revelation, liturgy, worship is revealed. So Isaiah, the call of Isaiah chapter 6, of the book of Isaiah, what did Isaiah see and what did he hear? He saw the glory of God. And the angels, seraphim and seraphim, who they were, singing. What was the song of the angels? Holy, holy, holy. holy. What do we do at Mass? Holy, holy, holy. The liturgy is revealed. Worship is revealed to us. We don't create it. We don't concoct it. Okay. And we're going to see that theme, basically, reverberating all through our, our course. So, we begin the proper understanding of the liturgy. <coughs> Many people have tried to understand the liturgical action. Okay? We will be explaining later what liturgy is, but in that nutshell, liturgy is understood, you have to understand it in a dual sense. Jesus Christ is the Leutogia. Meaning the liturgist. He is the liturgist. He is the one who offers That is liturgy. It's the liturgy, it's the liturgy. Okay? So, scripture refers to him thus. So, if it's the liturgy and offers worship, and we must offer worship, but our worship is not perfect, it can only be perfected only through his worship, through him, with him, and in him, as we say at Mass. So, the liturgy is. The worship we offer to God the Father through Christ our head, meaning head of the church. Okay? So that is how liturgy should be understood. Usually people say, oh, the liturgy, the worship, we offer to the Father, or the work of the people. That is inaccurate. The liturgy properly is the work of Christ. And then it becomes our work by invitation. The liturgy, the liturgist, calls us to join his act of worshiping the Father. So we are invited 
His worship becomes our worship. But always through Him, with Him, and in Him. We can't offer apart from Him because our worship is not acceptable to the Father. Except through Him, with Him, and in Him. Because He is the only one who can offer perfect worship to the Father. That's the meaning of liturgy in general. Okay? So Christ is the liturgist. He offers perfect worship to the Father. That is the cross, the sacrifice of the cross. Perfect worship to the Father. And that is the gift acceptable to the Father, the gift of the cross, the sacrifice he offers on the cross. So we offer that same sacrifice, okay, and we become worshippers of God the Father. So we truly, as we said earlier on in our course, we truly offer to the Father. We offer Christ, Christ offers us, but we offer him, we offer ourselves, we offer all people, we offer all creation. We indeed, we are offerers, yes, we worship God, but our worship is perfected by the worshiper, okay? the liturgia, the liturgist Christ. So our liturgy must always follow the liturgy of Christ, the worship of Christ. Because there is nothing we can offer to the Father that can be different from what Christ offers to the Father. We cannot come up with a way of worshiping God that is far more fitting than the worship Christ offers to the Father. It can happen. So that's why we don't concoct a liturgy. We receive it as a gift from God. And we offer up to God the very gift he has given to us. That's worship. Okay. <clears throat> so many people have tried to understand liturgical action from so many different points of view. However, this is important, however, the only sufficient point of view is the one given to us by the one from whom the gift of worship comes and to whom the gift of worship is directed, namely, God. Okay? So that's the only understanding we must have, because it's the only meaningful understanding. So to understand the reality of true worship, a believer needs to analyze the events of the Exodus. Meaning, no one can ever understand what worship is, what we do liturgically is, if we don't understand the book of Exodus. If we don't understand what happens in the Old Testament. It's impossible to understand liturgy. The Exodus is a perennial event taking place in each and every Christian life. It doesn't end. It's perennial until the end. We are on an ongoing exodus. So we need to go back to the book of Exodus, see exactly what happened, so that we know where we are coming from, to know where we are and where we are going. Without a proper understanding of the book of Exodus, the church doesn't know where it comes from, the church doesn't know where it is, the church doesn't know where it is going. Remember, Moses and Elijah, when they appeared with Jesus on the mountain of the transfiguration, we are told that we were discussing something. What were they talking about? They were discussing, talking about his departure. Okay? His exodus. Okay. So it's so meaning, so important to understand the Exodus. Okay. So to analyze the events, a believer needs to analyze the events of the Exodus, which in a sense is a perennial, ongoing event in the experience of every believer. As we're going to see, Saint Augustine told the neophytes, those who had just been baptized in Easter, he told them that you too left Egypt when you renounce his sin. That is our exodus. You too left Egypt when you were baptized. 
and you haven't yet reached the promised land, which is heaven. So we are on an exodus, which usually we call a pilgrimage. But the word exodus is more concrete okay, in meaning because when we talk about, we use the word pilgrimage, usually pilgrims return to their homes when you go on a pilgrimage. Like, you know, the first people who came from Europe, Europe to the US, they are called pilgrims. They never went back. <laughs> <laughs> we are still waiting. <laughs> That's not a pilgrimage. It was an exodus. They left and they never went back. Okay. So, so the word exodus is more theological in a sense. So in the events of the exodus, we truly discover the true objective of leaving Egypt. Egypt biblically symbolizes sin. Not that Egyptians are sinners, they're yeah. <laughs> all sinners, but biblically, they are symbol these places, they are geographical locations where they have symbolic value. So Egypt is sin, the desert, the wilderness is the cross, Canaan is the land flowing with milk and honey, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the land, which is heaven. Okay? So these are images. So you, the objective of leaving Egypt is sin. The Hebrews left Egypt in order to enter into a profound relationship with their God. What, what, does, the, what does the word Hebrew mean? Abraham, Abraham, the Hebrew. So Abraham is the Hebrew. The word Hebrew means to be set apart for divine use. That God calls you, he sets you apart and sends you on a mission. So that's why Abraham is the Hebrew. The one chosen by God, God set him apart and sent him on a mission. So his descendants are the Hebrews. Their, that nation is set apart, his descendants for a mission. They are God's possession for a purpose, for a mission. To be a blessing to all the nations. Okay, so that's the Hebrew. So the Hebrews left Egypt in order to enter into a profound relationship with their God. So this is very important. We leave sin, we leave Egypt to enter into a profound, not just a surface kind of you know superfluous, but a profound relationship with God. How? How do we enter into a profound relationship with their God? Why did the Hebrews leave Egypt? Why did God, what did God tell them? What did God say as their reason to leave Egypt? Why God was del delivering them from Egypt? So keep that in mind. Okay? So they left to enter into a deeper, profound relationship with God. How? So. This profound relationship is worship. Okay? So this profound relationship, worship, worship, is what defines them as a people who belong and a people who possess. Worship defines them and us as people who belong. Belong to what? To God. To who? To God. Worship defines us as belonging to God. Remember that the importance of worship is this. All through eternity, the angels and the saints will be worshipping God. That's the work of heaven. That's what we will be doing in heaven. Worship God. That's why worship is understood as a gift. A revelation of what heaven is. Not just a replica, okay, but what heaven is. Heaven is constant worship. That is the work of the angels and saints. So that is what we will be doing. So that's what it means to belong to God. So we start here below 
by worshiping God, and that way we prove that we truly be long to Him. Worship is a gift of love God gives to us. So we don't, again we say, we don't concoct worship. We receive it as a divine gift. Okay. And people who possess, possess what? Because when we enter into a profound relationship with God, God dwells somewhere. His dwelling is called heaven. So we possess the land. We possess heaven. <clears throat> so when the Hebrews left Egypt, belonging to God, they had to be planted in their own land, where they are free to worship their own God. Because in bondage in Egypt, when you are subjugated, subservient to someone, then you have to worship their gods. You are not free to worship your God. They will force you to sin, do whatever they do. But when you are freed by God for something they are going to seek for worship, then God will plant you somewhere where you are free and you are at peace to worship Him. If you reject that relationship or if you fall away from that relationship, what happens? You go back to Egypt. You go back to bondage. Hence, the exile in Babylon. That's a second Egypt. Because you refused it to worship. Okay. So, people who possess, they belong to God and therefore they possess the land, not the other way around. You don't go to heaven and then belong to God. In this world I can do whatever I want. But when I die, then I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll decide whether I want to be with God forever or not. No, it's not the other way around. So they cannot possess the land in a truth if they do not belong to God in truth and in spirit. So if you don't belong to God in truth and spirit, you will be taken out of the land, Canaan, and be thrown back into bondage. That's why the Babylonian captivity is very important in the history of salvation. To know what happens to us when we fall away from God. We hire ourselves up again into slavery. Okay. So when God decides to intervene and to rescue his people, his original command to Pharaoh is said to him. Okay. God commanded Moses, said to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you with the message. What is the message? We hear that often, let my people go. That's all we hear. Okay. Then God, you know, Moses tells Pharaoh, let my, God tells Moses, God tells Pharaoh, let my people go. That's half the sentence. But that's what we normally hear. Let my people go. Let my people go. And do what? So, you are in bondage in Egypt. God frees you from bondage. Now you are free okay, from, from their oppressors. God has freed you. You said, God, I'm free. You know, bye bye Egypt. Bye bye God. <laughs> I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> no. So it's not let my people go, but let my people go to they are going for a purpose to serve me in the wilderness. So we are freed for service, and the service is worship. Okay? Let my people go to serve me in the wilderness. But as yet, you have not listened. To me, Pharaoh was stubborn. This same command is repeated in Exodus chapter 9, verse 1, and verse 13, and in chapter 10, verse 3. So I'll, I'll ask you to read those texts, okay? those chapters in Exodus. They're very important. Okay? Let my people go to serve me is the command given by God. To, of the Hebrews to Pharaoh. Remember, this command is not to the Hebrews, this command is to Pharaoh. The figure of Pharaoh is very, very important in this explanation of the liturgy. 
we hear Pharaoh considering halfway. So when you read the text again, telling the Hebrews to okay, go, sacrifice to your God in the wilderness, provided that you do not go too far away. Okay? Pharaoh still wants to exert power over the people of God. Okay, go serve, but in the wilderness, but in Egypt. In other words, they can sacrifice to their God in the land of Egypt. Meaning, in bondage, in slavery. I can still serve God in my sinfulness. You know, God understands, you know? No. No. So, Pharaoh seems to imply. But Moses insists in obedience to God's command. Moses is a religious figure of all time. This is what religious leaders are supposed to do in the face of Pharaoh. We'll explain who Pharaoh is, in essence. But Moses insists in obedience to God's command. Remember also Peter insisted, okay, at the vessel who was fighting Pharaoh in the Sanhedrin. They told him, okay, we are going to let you go, but don't talk about that name again. Peter said, you let me to tell me, should I obey God or you? Okay, so falling in line, in the line of Moses, a great leader, Peter is a great leader. Okay? In obedience to God's command that they must go, they must leave Egypt in order to worship. They must go to the wilderness just as God had commanded, not as Pharaoh wants. This is very significant. We'll read more next week, but let's explain something here. Again, explaining Pharaoh. So, the Pharaoh of today, in our leaders, is called a secular humanist. So a secular humanist will tell you, you know, you have religions, okay? What are your religions? Protestant. What else? Hindu. What else? Buddhist. What else? Catholic. What else? Scientology. What else? Jehovah. As you go. So, a secular humanist okay, is our modern pharaoh. This can be your dictators or dictators. Okay? So, what they, they are telling us that we have so many religions. Okay? So, and these religions are sometimes fighting each other. So, secular humanism. Who is now Pharaoh? Remember, Pharaoh wants to be God. But we know that he's not God, he is. Okay? <laughs> so, what he says, this is very dangerous. Okay? Some of our recent leaders brought this to the fore. They didn't start it, but they made it basically more amplified. So, what happens is this. We have to be very shrewd. So a secular humanist will tell all religions, okay, that okay, since you know we don't agree and we need public order, okay, so let's build what we call consensus. Okay? So how do you build a consensus? Okay, you are Catholics, you are Buddhists, you are Hindus, you are whatever come to the table. We want all to get along, right? There's nothing wrong with getting along. So we need to get along with one another. Okay? So a secular humanist is providing the framework of peace. And by succumbing to the framework of peace, a secular humanist is asking for Okay? You have to arrive at everything or something everyone agrees with. 
Okay? Everyone agrees with. So if you have, uh, if you are stubborn and you want to destroy the peace a secular humanist is creating, you are going to be penalized. You are going to be punished by Pharaoh. So Pharaoh says to the poor Clares that you will give contraceptives to your workers. The poor players say, no, we will not concede the truth. Why? Because it doesn't belong to us. It's revealed to us by God. We can't concede what God commands us to do. And the secular human says, okay, I'm going to punish you if you don't concede. So that is Pharaoh. A modern Pharaoh, Pharaoh of our day. And many of us, unfortunately, not officially like as church, but many of us have conceded. Well, what is the difference? Can we all get along? <laughs> My faith is private. Why? Because the secular humanist is providing a framework where God must be out. Keep your God in your churches. And then we say, my faith is private. Because we have succumbed to the framework of a secular humanist. Now, the one who rules over us as our God is Pharaoh. Because we don't have the courage to resist the Pharaoh and tell him that we will not conceal the truth. Because we don't create truth, truth is a gift we receive from God. And you are asking us to build a consensus. We will not do it. That's what Moses did. That's what Peter did. So we ask ourselves, do we have the courage today to resist the Pharaoh? There are poor countries around the world, and they are ruled over by dictators, and the church pays taxes. But you have Catholic schools in those countries. You have Catholic hospitals. The richest nation on earth is being held hostage by Pharaoh over tax exemption. The richest nation on earth. Don't say that. We may lose our tax exemption, exemption status. And we are the United States of America. Pharaoh is holding us hostage. Because if you don't concede and agree with the godless framework under the guise of peace, you will be unable to worship. We always say, well, God is no longer allowed in the public square. This is the public square Pharaoh has built. And many of us have accepted it. And yet we complain. We are ready to concede the truth. Okay? But we complain about how they shoot, oh, these shootings. There is no God in schools and no whatever. Whose fault? How many of us have considered the truth under the guise of a fake peace? There cannot be peace without the truth. And the truth is not built by, built by consensus. Truth is a revelation, a gift given to us by God. Whenever we concede the truth, we suffer. I think some of you have heard about, we'll continue with this next week, but some of you heard about this story. A man was given a cross to carry, and he was basically given the way. You know, this is the destination of the world, the way here. So he was told how to get there. The cross was heavy. So he got to a point where he said, no, this is too much. So he went to the back of the cross, cut off a piece, and threw it away. Then it became lighter, you know. Then as we went along, along the way, there was a river he had to cross. And the cross that was given to him was simply the right length to lay over the river, cross by way of his cross, and then pull the cross and keep going. <coughs> when he got here, the cross wouldn't fit. So he was stuck. That's what we do when we concede the truth. We can't get to where we belong. So, Pharaoh is not dead. The Exodus is not dead. 
But the question is in every generation, do we have powerful religious leaders like Moses, like Peter, who can stand up to Pharaoh and say that we will not concede the truth? Pharaoh threatens punishment. I will take away your tax exemption. And the leaders, oh, okay. Pharaoh says, take it away. If that's what you want to do. That's what Moses says. I will not concede. Because I don't know with which we will serve the Lord. God told me to take everything to get out of Egypt. And Pharaoh is saying, okay, leave A, B, C, D. Moses says, I don't know with which we will serve the Lord in the desert. Well, if what we leave behind is what God asks, asks us to serve with him, what will we do? We are not leaving behind anything. Meaning, we are not making any concessions about the truth. Yes, that's conceded. Yeah, that's conceded. We are not conceding. So, we need courage today. We are afraid of Pharaoh in many areas. Because Pharaoh has the power to punish us. So we want, we fall and settle for a fake peace. But all of us know there is no peace here. Because there is no God, there is no truth. So we have to stop pretending that we belong here because we don't. And embark on the tough way okay, of basically persecution, punishment from Pharaoh and things like that. But we must go, we must keep moving forward. We must listen to God, not Pharaoh. Okay, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and shall be, the world without end. Thanks for coming, and have a good night. Thank you.